Hello Wachong students, I'm Mr. Kelvin Tan. In this video, I'll be explaining the reason for comparative advantage based on factor endowment. Now, in your tutorial lessons, right, your tutor will typically teach you the proof of the law of comparative advantage using what we call a 2x2 two two table. What do I mean? 2x2 two two means we pick two countries and two goods, so you have 2x2. Two and we select numbers such that one country will end up having a CA in one good and the other will have a CA in another good. Okay, CA here means comparative advantage. Now, your tutor might also remind you to select the numbers carefully. If you select Singapore and Thailand as your two countries, rice and MP3 players as your two goods, for example, for your explanation to make sense, right, you should not select numbers such that in the end, you find that Singapore have a CA in rice, while Thailand have a CA in MP3 players. Because we know in the real world, Singapore does not export rice. So if you select the wrong numbers, okay, you will have a problem. One question you might be wondering in your head is, if that's the case, how does one explain comparative advantage of countries? How did Singapore end up having a CA in electronic goods? Why are we so sure that Singapore does not have a CA in growing rice? So the objective of this lesson is to explain why. This concept is known as the difference in factor endowments. You will be using this concept to answer part A of your tutorial essay question 3 on Singapore's pattern of trade. Two key terms you have to understand here is factor abundance, what it means, and the other one is factor intensive, what does it mean? In your 2x2 two two model, right, to give you an introduction, factor abundance is a term used to describe countries, while factor intensity is used to describe goods. So if you recall what I just said, right, in the 2x2, two two, the first two refers to countries, the other two refers to goods. So you use factor abundance to describe the countries, factor intensity used to describe goods. What do we mean by factor abundance? And more specifically, what do we mean by relative abundance in factors? Now, think about two factors of production, capital and labor. We know that some countries, right, because of their large population size, we can classify them as countries with that are relatively more labor abundant. Some such countries like that would be India and China. We know these two countries have a huge population size. They are relatively more labor abundant. On the other hand, right, countries like United States and Singapore, we classify them as relatively more capital abundant. Singapore should be quite well known, right? Our population is small, limited, so you usually will not classify Singapore as a relatively labor abundant country. If there's a choice between capital and labor, we will it's easier and more accurate to classify Singapore as relatively capital abundant. So we are done with countries, let's look at goods. Some goods, right, we know that they use relatively more capital than labour. So manufacturing goods, for example, right, typically use a lot of technology, a lot of machinery, so they, use, they are what we call relatively capital intensive. On the other hand, there will be goods like textiles that uses relatively more labour than capital. So we will classify such goods as relatively labour intensive. So what do you do now is this, you have your two countries that you classify in terms of factor abundance, another two countries you classify, and another two, uh, another two goods you classify as relatively factor intensive. What you do is this, you match the relative factor abundance of countries to the, rel to the factor intensity of goods. What, are, what do I mean? So China, right, we agree that China is relatively labor abundant. So, we are trying to say that China should be better at producing goods that are relatively labor intensive. So we match the labor abundance with the labor intensive goods. On the other hand, United States, we classify them as being relatively capital abundant. We feel they should be better at producing goods that are relatively capital intensive. What do I mean by better? So what you write in your essay, of course, should be clear. Okay, not, don't just use the word better. So let me specify how you should ex explain it. Countries that are relatively more abundant in labor, 
okay, relatively labour abundant. China, for example, they would have a lower opportunity cost, which is comparative advantage, in goods that uses relatively more labour, or what we call labour intensive goods. On the other hand, countries that are relatively more abundant in capital, United States, for example, should have a comparative advantage, a lower of course, in goods that uses relatively more capital. That's what better means. Now, so I've explained to you the basic framework. You can think of a few extension. Extension one, within labor itself, right, you may want to split the factor of production into skilled labor and unskilled labor. Okay, so in this case, the, the two factors we are talking about is no longer capital and labor, but rather skilled labor and unskilled labor. So when you look at Singapore and China, for example, you could think about Singapore, right? We are relatively abundant in skilled labor. We have a higher proportion of our workers are skilled. A country like China is opposite. Okay, they are relatively more abundant in unskilled labor, means a higher percentage of their total workforce are concentrated on unskilled labor. So you have to be careful about this. What I am not saying uh, is that China has less skilled labor than us. Okay? This is all about relative and not absolute. China, of course, I will agree they have absolutely more skilled workers as well as more unskilled workers compared to Singapore. But just that as a percentage of our workforce, a bigger percentage of Singapore's workforce is skilled labor. Whereas for China, a bigger percentage of their workforce, their labor force, is unskilled. So let's do the matching again. If you compare Singapore and China, right? Since we argue that Singapore is relatively abundant in skilled labor, we would tend to have a lower op cost in goods eh, that are relatively more skilled labor intensive. Thus, we could say that Singapore has a comparative advantage in producing high-end electronic goods. China, on the other hand, they will have a lower opportunity cost, they have a CA, in goods that are relatively more unskilled labor intensive. So, this, for example, this will give her a CA in producing more mainstream electronic goods. The next extension to, right, the extension to that I'm talking about is that relative factor endowments can change over time, especially in the era of globalization when there's free movement of capital and labor. A good example is China. Okay, we I've begun with the assumption that China is either a relatively labor abundant or relatively unskilled labor abundant. However, do be aware that over time, Okay, with globalization, a lot of MNCs, right, they are now investing in China. So you have learned in your ADAS framework that investment in the long run will end up increasing the quantity of capital. And at the same time, China is slowly improving their educational system. Okay, so with this, right, we could argue that it, over time, in the long run, it is possible for the percentage of factors of production to change such that China is slowly becoming more uh, relatively capital abundant as well as relatively skilled labor abundant. Hence, they are able to develop a CA in high-end electronic goods. Okay, so uh, just bear this ex extension in mind. Your SA2A will require this understanding, so it's coming soon. And finally, ex extension 3, water trade between Malaysia and Singapore. Now, so far we have talked about labor and capital only. But of course, land can also be considered in the analysis as well. So I'm going to use this, right? I'm going to include land, and I'm trying to use this to explain how Singapore and Johor end up trading water among themselves. Let's ask, who, which country, what factor abundance do you think it would take uh, to have a lower op cost in catching rainwater? Now, it should be quite clear that the more land you have, Okay, the op cost for you catching rainwater will be lower. So we know that Johor and Singapore, right? If you compare just Johor and Singapore, Johor is relatively more abundant in land. Hence, their op cost in terms of catching rainwater, collecting rainwater, will be lower, and hence they have a comparative advantage in rainwater. Thus, Johor will sell the rainwater to Singapore. But what does it take eh, to transform rainwater into clean drinking water? What I'm asking is, what kind of factor intensity is the clean drinking water? 
Now, it shouldn't be too uh, difficult to see that to transform ordinary rainwater into clean drinking water, you require a lot of skilled labour as well as capital. And Singapore happens to be a country that is, compared to Johor at least, more abundant in capital as well as skilled labour. So what Singapore does is to we, we buy the rainwater from, Singapore, from Johor, okay, we import the, the rainwater, the raw rainwater from Johor, but we transform the rainwater into drinking water and sell it back to Johor. What I'm trying to say here is that some, sometimes in the case study, right, you might get statistics that show that you know, Singapore have a column of goods they export as well as a column where it shows the type of goods that Singapore import. You might see water appearing in both columns. Don't be confused. Okay? Singapore imports rainwater but export drinking water. So with this in mind, right, you can also explain oil. Oil is a common good that appears in both. So can you explain using CA? So that's the end of today's lesson. So I hope with this, you understand how better how to link factor endowment to explain why countries have different comparative advantage. Thank you.